Officer Grupke uh, with the Venetia Police Department, and I will be your guide and protector tonight on this tour up First Street. Historic figures in the history of Venetia, and we are going to we are going to meet and, and be greeted by the spirit of those historic figures. The first one we're going to stop at and see will be Jack London, and uh, after that we will be uh, greeted by the spirit of Gertie Gallardo. Gerdy Gallardo was the madam of the Jurgensen Saloon, which was right across the street. And then uh, we we get up to uh, F Street, where we will meet the spirit of Milo Pasolacqua. Milo, who lived to be over 100, 101 years old, uh, uh, was the founder of the Venetia Vallejo Stage Line. Uh, a really interesting character who started the bus line with uh, no money, no bus, and uh, uh, no driver's license. He didn't know how to drive. <laughs> Never driven a car in all his life. Anyway, uh, and then it will end up in front of uh, what was called the Bank of Venetia, which is Sandoval's restaurant today, uh, <laughs> and meet um, the spirit of Mary Farmer, who will tell us the story of a wild shootout and a, and a murder in front of her house. Here at the historic depot, which was in the older buildings in Venetia, a lot of people say, well, where's the train? How, how did this work? There's water there and so forth. But the train used to come into Venetia before there were any bridges and come right down here. This depot was, was erected here in 1901. It originally was built for a station across the bay, but the, the, the uh, Central Pacific Railroad changed their route and the railroad, the depot was out in the middle of nowhere, so they picked it up, barged it over here, and put it right here. So it's been here since 1901. The trains used to come across here, going up on a train ferry and go across the bay to Port Costa. It was an extremely busy, busy railroad and a busy, busy route. And all the trains that came to the West Coast that ended up in San Francisco or, or Oakland came through Venetia, right here. So it was a very busy area. So this was a very this was the industrial part of Venetia in that railroad era, and I'm talking about the period of time from um, all 1870 to 1930. Tanneries here, the big tannery where we'll meet uh, Gertie Gallardo, the, the hooker with the heart, and um, 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 canne canneries as well. Uh, fish canneries initially, and then later on they canned fruit here in Venetia. And uh, there was creamery, there was a pest uh, uh, patrol company that was here. So all the industry of Venetia was down at the bottom of First Street. Today we're accustomed to being out in the industrial park. That was all army property, that was all the arsenal and so forth. So any industry or any big business in Venetia was down here. Okay. It was a very busy area, very, very active. Trains coming and going, boats coming in and out, river boats up and down, and an awful lot of activity, a lot of people coming to work here, and to play as well, okay? So let's go up the street and we'll go to our first station and we'll meet the spirit of Jack What's this? Hello. Oh, hello. Good evening. Fellow Venetians. I'm Jack London. I was laying up on Sonoma Mountain. That's where I'm buried. And I said, you know, I want to come back and see how the old town's doing, the hometown. And it's been a long time. It looks a lot different. But you know, there's a lot of stories that are going around about Jack London. Like, for example, I got here in 1892 when I was 16. And the way I got here was I borrowed three hundred dollars, and I bought the a sloop called the Tizzy Lizzie, and I was the oyster pirate on the San Francisco Bay. You know that gets a little dangerous. People are always after you. And then I found out they needed someone in the law enforcement, and so I became a lawman. Can you imagine that? Me a pirate, and now I'm a lawman. Of course, I didn't get any salary, but they said I could keep 50% of all the fines that I collected. 
And boy, did I find him. And I was, I was really a tough guy. All I had was a metal fork when I would get on their boat to arrest them. Of course, there was a time over on Martinez Pier that I tried to arrest two, two of those fishermen over there. And all the other fishermen started chasing me down the pier. And they almost caught me, but I got away. Didn't get the fine, though. Missed out on that. Now, the stories about my drink, they're all not true. <laughs> well, all right, so they're all true. There was one night I was really having a good time. And I was coming back down to the pier, and I ran into this fish net that somebody had put on the on the pier there and I got all tangled up in the pier in the net and I couldn't get out and I just I finally just fell and went to sleep. And the next morning I'm tangled in the net, snoring away, and all the passerbys had a lot of amusement for my on my behalf. <laughs> now the other story that is definitely true is about John Barleycorn. Now, John Barleycorn is liquor. I was coming down after a really good night to come down and get on my sloop. And I jumped on my sloop and I went right on over. Right in the water. And here I am bobbing away in the water. The current's starting to take me out. And at first I said, well, uh, well, this feels pretty good, just bobbing away. And then I hear this John Barleycorn say, just let go. You can be a hero. You'll float out and you'll be a hero. It'll be a hero's death. That sounded pretty good, pretty good. So I'm starting out there. I'm singing away. I'm bobbing away. And then John Barleycorn says, shh, they can hear you on the Solano Wharf. They, they go all night on the, on the ferry there. And they might hear you and come out and rescue you. Oh. Quiet. Then eventually I got all the way over by the Mare Island Strait where the Napa River comes in and the, the, it's just, it's all turmoil, the water and everything. And I was getting water over my head and I was <coughs> getting it in my mouth and I was choking. And then I was getting really cold, you know, it was getting cold out there and I was getting sober. <laughs> <laughs> Going along here, so wait a minute, you know, uh, uh, that would be a good reason to live. Um, ooh, now there's another good reason to live. Uh, I wanted to live. So I tried to swim to shore, but I was too tired. I just, oh, this is it. I figured I was goner. I was even going to go ahead and have that hero's death. And then along came this Greek fishing boat. And a Greek fisherman just picked me right out of the water. Saved me. To live another day. Like they say, the rest is history. The next year, I wrote my first novel. And I wrote a total of 55 novels in my short life. But the best novel was based right here in Benicia. My favorite hometown of Benicia was John Barleycorn. This particular location, and this particular corner, on this corner, was the Venetia, was called initially the Venetia Tannery, also the Coleman and Saul's Tannery, which was here for a period what actually stood from 1870 to 1947 or 8 when the fire destroyed it all. But it was a five story uh, brick building. If you could visualize from here, the entire next block of a five-story building with a uh, walkway across the first street that went over to another building on that side of the street which was three stories tall brick building as well and you know hence the the tannery that you see today the tannery building is really a facade and somewhat of a remnant but it's not the real original building it's a facade to uh, represent what used to be there. But from here all the way up for, for the next block, full city block was a huge five-story building and a, um, uh, 
uh, enterprise that employed an awful lot of Benicia citizens. A lot of people worked in, in the tanneries in the city of Benicia. There was also two other ones on the west end of town. So Benicia was well known as a tannery town. I mean, it, we went through a period of time when we were a, um, a, a railroad town, then we were an industrial town, an army town. So we have a lot of different histories to our uh, to point to in our past. So let's walk up and we'll meet and see if we can find the third part. Yeah, we're just walking by. Oh, you Come on be in, part please. of that history tour. That's us. All right. Well, listen, I'll make you a little video. You can only stay just a tiny little while because I'm working. <laughs> and this is actually my corner. But I just took in our little extra work tonight. They asked me to tell you a little bit about history. Let me see if, my name, by the way, is Sirena. And I'm just going to, Sirena's going to find her notes here, if you don't mind. Ooh, Captain. How are you? Oh, all right, we'll talk about that later. Uh, now, let's see here. I'll just tell you, you know that Venetia has always been an industrial metropolis. And way back in 1879, there was the construction of the Venetia Tannery Building. And it became the center of the tannery industry on the West Coast. Actually, the tannery building stood on this very spot. It was about five-story brick building. And it dominated all this part of First Street. Actually, it was here for many, oh, well, hi there. Hello. Well, come on in. <laughs> this is a command performance. I recognize this character in the beer. Oh, no, that's a cat. <laughs> anyway, there the depression took its toll and the building was uh, abandoned for many, many years. And then it remained empty and then a terrible, devastating fire came and destroyed it in 1949. It was the largest fire in Venetia's history. And people from all around came to help fire, uh, fight the fire. And actually, one of the most interesting things was that they dispatched a, a fire truck from Martinez and it crossed the strait on the ferry to come and help <laughs> control the inferno. Now, I don't know why they put this in here, but I think it's sort of cute. It says, at one time, the tannery was one of the largest employers in town, and all the men who worked there were good customers and perfect gentlemen. <laughs> I just love that. In the early 20th century, Venetia supplied one-third of California's leather, much of it tanned on this site by Coleman Salls and Company. And beginning in 1881, early tannery structures occupied the western half of this block. And by 19, 1891, tannery structures covered the entire block. That's both sides on, on the entire block, from, a, from uh, B to C Street. This is C Street right over here. C Street never did go through. Three-story brick building was sited on First Street, sprawling sheds holding mountains of tan bark from Humboldt County lined East 2nd Street and on this side, and an imposing five-story brick rolling building was right here, dominated the area near C and First Streets. And as I mentioned to you earlier, there was an overhead covered walkway which linked the two buildings, so you didn't have to cross the street, you could walk back and forth. And that was the offices over there as well. At its production height, the tannery employed over 300 local workers, all men I will point out, <laughs> primarily Portuguese and Greek. It ceased Benicia operations in 1928, and the buildings were vacated. A series of fires erupted following the facility's closure, causing the destruction of all buildings by 1945. So it was really a, uh, a very, very important part of Benicia's history. And there was a lot of activity here as well. Who was it? Oh. <laughs> well, listen, I hate to have to hurry you on. I'm waiting for a date. Okay. Yeah. All right. Many dates. <laughs> Thank you so very, you very Milo. much. We're going to go see Milo. Tell him all that you're talking to. Him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that you, Milo? I like your outfit. Hi, everybody.
buddy, come on, get off the street so you don't get run over. I am portraying Milo Pasolacqua. You might have heard the name. The uh, Pasolacqua family has been in the Vallejo Venetia area for over 220 years. Except by my dad or myself. Um, my folks came to the United States uh, in the 1880s during that 1880s, 1910, 30-year period when large numbers of people came from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. They came from Genoa, Italy, home of Christopher Columbus. I was born in Venetia in 1886. Anyone want to bet or guess where I was born? You've all been there, except for the young ones. These are three letters. H-S. I was born on the site of Venetia High School. My folks came from Italy. They're farmers. They came here because an uncle of mine ha had a produce shop in Vallejo. And they bought some property. At that time, it was outside the city limits of Venetia. And it was a farm. So I was born where the school is now. I was raised up by my father, and with uh, my father, I peddled vegetables and fruits all over town. Now, some of you may know that this street is a dividing street between the nice part of town and the not nice part of town. If you were to cross, especially a young man of good bearing and a young woman of high moral fiber, just to cross this, lot, this street and you were seen at that end of town, you had a smudge on your reputation. I want you to remember that. While I was peddling vegetables and fruits, I was forced to go to that part of town. And I spent some time down there talking with different people, sometimes well into the evening, selling vegetables. I also worked at the three canneries in town. One of them is a, 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 salt, a, a salt one that was torn down many years ago and at the two shipyards, the Robinson Shipyard and the Matthew Turner, and as you know, Matthew Turner is now a school in town. And um, I also worked for Ray Rankin. He had a vegetable uh, 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 stand and uh, uh, up on the 900 block, three blocks up. And again, I was forced to come to this end of town and spent many hours convincing people to buy vegetables and fruits <laughs> well into the evening sometimes. While I was working for Ray Rankin, some Sharpies, con artist from uh, Vallejo, our sister city, had a plan to buy some land over where the state park is now, where the ferry boat was, and where Spangler's ferry boat was on that They were going to put some houses in, and they were going to run a bus service from Vallejo to Venetia back and forth to get people to the main uh, line. Well, they ran out of money. And I decided that, I was 29 at the time, 1915, that it was time for me to make my, work, my way in the world. I needed $1,000 to get from them the bus that they had on hold for Buick Theater in San Francisco on what used to be Auto Roll in, in uh, 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 Van Ness Avenue in San Francisco. Some of you more mature people would remember that. <laughs> so I needed $1,000 to get the bus because I figured if they can't do the bus service, I'll do the bus service. Um, so I had 100, 250 bucks that I had saved up from peddling vegetables and fruits, some of them down there. And so I needed 750 bucks. So where are you going to go to get the money? The bank. The bank. You go to the bank. The bank just up the road here. Now, the, uh, the person who owned the bank was, are you ready for this? His name was Mr. Crooks. <laughs> C-R-O-O-K-S. Are you ready for this? He was also the mayor of the town on and off for close to 22 years. He'd probably get elected president now. <laughs> so I went into the bank. Is, is Mr. Crooks, the bank manager, going to give me, a farm boy who spent time down there, far about $500? No. Nope. I'm just a country bump. I'm a country bumpkin. So I talked to my dad. I need 750 bucks. Where am I going to go? He says, let's go over to Venetia Brewery to where Gus is, and I spent some time talking with Gus well into the evening. So I went down to talk to Gus about, with my dad, to see if I could get some money from Gus. Do you think the bartender's gonna loan me some money? 
good customer. Yeah. Okay, she's going to loan me $500. I now have $750. I need another $25. I go to Wally Wasserman, the Wasserman family in town. has a butcher shop. So I go to Wally and I say I need $250. Our families are friends with each other. So it gives me this $250. I now have $1,000 in cash, all in a hole in my pocket. I have to go to San Francisco. Can I drive there? No. I take the ferry boat across to uh, um, um, Rocket. I take the train to Oakland, the ferry boat across to San Francisco, a trolley car to Van Ness, walk up Van Ness, and I buy the bus for $1,000. Except I had forgot a very, very important thing. What do you think I forgot to know how to do? Drive. Drive the bus. <laughs> the country boy didn't know mechanics for anything. So I decided, I gave him the money. I said, I'll be back tomorrow with a friend, Bert Manson, who told me he knew how to drive the bus. So I repeat my tail back. I go over to Bert's house. I say, Bert, listen. Blah, 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 blah. He says, good, I'll go with you. So we take the ferry boat, the train, the ferry boat, the trolley car, get the bus. I find out that Bert doesn't know much more than I do. <laughs> so it takes us a whole day or more to get from San Francisco up to here. He teaches me how to drive, he sort of learns himself, we get here. We then start the Vallejo Venetia stage line, which ran for 75 years. It ended, it was sold uh, in 1990. Now you might wonder, what are we standing here for? Guess what this was? The depot. I'm Mary Farmer. I'm the, I'm the spirit of Mary Farmer. Well, I came to Venetia in 1889, I believe I was. It was 1889. And you know, I'm pretty old, so I don't remember for sure how old I was when I came. I think I was somewhere between 18 and 20. And I taught school right here in Venetia. You know where Taco Bell is? Well, that's where I taught school. There was a school there. It was called Venetia Primary School. And it was just a one-room one schoolhouse. And right on the corner, there was a little corral for horses because we were out in the country. And so the children would have to bring their ride a horse or their bicycles to school and they'd keep their horses out of the corral out there. When I first came to town, I lived right down the street here, and then later on I moved out right closer to the school. And so I lived there, I taught at Mary Farmer for 32, 32 years was it Mr. Hayes? I think, I think so. it was. That's a long time. The first one to tell you, you know how much money I made? I remember I was so excited that very first paycheck I got. I worked a whole month and I got $62.50. So, and I, it was, it was. I taught there for, I believe it was like 32 years. But I'm not here to talk about me, I'm here to tell you a story. When I, and this story, this happened before I got here. But you know how stories are in small towns. Everybody has a story and they tell it forever and ever. So I'm going to tell you the story the way I heard it. So when this, in, in oh, I'm going to say 1883 or somewhere around there, this was the bank. This was the Bank of Venetia, um, or some people say it was the People's Bank, one of those names. And like I said, I lived right down the street down there. But in those days, Venetia was called, sometimes it was called the Athens of the West because we had so many schools here. We had lots of schools. We had um, St. Mary's, we had St. Catherine's, we had, um, oh, I can't remember them all, but they were very, very good schools and people sent their children to the, sent, sent their children here to be boarded and for education because we did, just like we have now, we had good schools so people learned. Well, there was a school called St. Augustine. St. Augustine was a military boys' school. It was for, for young men, just past high school, a little bit of college age, and there, there was a man named John Crook, and his son went to, went to uh, St. Augustine. And Bishop uh, Wayfield had a son who was a head, was a cadet there, and his job was 
was to appoint a cadet of the year. And Mr. Wing, Mr. Crook, or Mr. Excuse me, Master Wingfield, who was to make this appointment, he made, an, made the appointment, and Mr. Crook was very upset because he thought his son should have been named, given this high honor of Cadet of the Year. His son was a strong leader, he was good academically, he was just a good, good young man, and Mr. Crook really felt like he was really took offense that his son was not named um, Cadet of the Year, and he held a kind of like a grudge. He was really upset at, at, at Master Wingfield. Well, Mr. Crook lived, he had a, he had, was building a mansion. He had, you've heard of the Crook's Mansion. It was down here at the end of West 3rd Street. One day he was coming, walking from there to the bank. He must have had a lot of money because he had a guard with him with, with a gun. He ran into Master Wingfield. They got into a fight, some kind of fight, and he shot him. Mr. Crook, shot Master Wingfield. They took Ma Master Wingfield. I'm sorry, I don't remember Mr. Wingfield's first name, so I'm calling him Master Wingfield. But they took him home to the, the um, Bishop Wingfield's home, which is still here. It's on East 2nd, between East 2nd and East 3rd on Wingfield Way. And so he died. Ms Mr. Crook was very, very upset that that should happen. He went over to the Wingfields and he apologized and they accepted his apology. He went, he was tried, but he was found innocent. But he was, I think, you know, he was probably very upset about what happened. He sold his house. He had just finished building that house. He sold the house to his brother, William. So it's now called the Crooks Mansion, William Crook. William and his wife, Fanny, had four children. They lived in that house. Mr. Crook died when he was in 1950. He was 89 years old. His wife died a year later. They had four children. Two of them died, and in, in, uh, one of them, when she was 12, in a, he or she, in a bicycle accident. Another one died in an automobile accident. The oldest daughter, Alice, lived in the house until she passed away and then sold in his business.